Hey, good morning. We got a lot of things to do today, so we're going to get right into it. First of all, Thursday morning, our parishioner of Josh's grandmother died. Um, at this time, I would like to bring have him come up and say a few words. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, as Pastor Pete has stated, my grandmother has passed away. Um, it's very been very difficult for me, personally, to cope. Uh, everybody copes with death differently. I, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> um, I just the thing that keeps me going is knowing that she's in God's hands and that she has God's love. Thank you. And now, if we could just have a moment of silence for Josh's grandmother. Thank you. Also, it's October 9th, and you can see by the picture on the pulpit, it's John Lennon's 71st birthday. And I think today's sermon is appropriate for it, since John was a peace activist who spent his life trying to spread peace and died violently on December 8th. So, as for the sermon today, I don't think anyone would disagree that our culture is too violent and that we need to do something to bring about a more peaceful society. No one needs to be convinced of that. What people often disagree on is how to go about it. Everyone's got different opinions on what we should do. Do we need more police? Do we need more social programs for children at risk? Do we need to ban certain firearms? Do we need to allow for more purchase of guns? Should we support capital punishment? Should we halt the death penalty? Do we commit more money to military spending? Do we move the funds to other areas? Do we strike another country preemptively in order to prevent them from striking us first? Do we continue to occupy another country with our military? Should we withdraw our troops? All these are questions that are debated on both sides of the issue. What I want to lay out for you is where Jesus weighs in on the question of violence. Because we are Christians, we claim to be followers of the teachings of Jesus Christ. And what I'm going to put on the table to, will be controversial. There will be voices that claim it's too radical. There will be some who say it won't work. And there will be those who disagree. But here it is. In his nonviolent teachings, life and death, Jesus revealed the God of, in, of nonviolence. That means that Christians are to make a commitment to nonviolence. Christians are called to nonviolence without exception when engaging the questions such as those I listed earlier. The true follower of Christ will always come down on whatever solution is the nonviolent one. Now don't misunderstand me. Jesus did not teach non-resistance. We are not called to passively allow evil to have its way. Jesus didn't call for us to be wimps or doormats for bullies to walk all over us. Rather, what he taught us was how to resist violence in a nonviolent way. We are to engage evil nonviolently in every circumstance and lean on divine grace, trusting that the Holy Spirit will reveal the third way non the third way not evident in the situation. Jesus' words in our reading from Matthew are very clear. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. In the words of author Walter Mink Walter Wink from his book Engaging the Powers, violence can, never, violence can Never Stop Violence, because its very success leads others to imitate it. Paradoxically, violence is most dangerous when it succeeds. Conversely, nonviolence never fails because every nonviolent act is a revelation of God's new order, breaking it upon the world. But I'll be the first to admit that finding nonviolent solutions is very difficult. You know why? Because we have been taught for thousands of years that violence is the last resort. Now at first, this seems to be a reasonable teaching. When all else fails, we're told 
when talking no longer works, when sanctions are not effective, when negotiations break down. Then pick up your fist or gun or bomb and pummel the other party until they submit. The problem with this teaching is that it is a fallacy. Violence is never the last resort. Most of the time it is the second or third resort. Sometimes it is even the first resort. If violence is an option, the temptation to use violence is too strong to resist. History demonstrates that at every turn, the only way to truly have peace is to be completely committed to nonviolence as a first, middle, and last resort. But what if? That's the question that inevitably follows. What if someone comes after my child with a gun? What if someone invades my home? What if another country attacks us? How can we defend ourselves if we are, allow if we are not allowed to use violence? Here's the thing, if someone attacks you with a gun, or any weapon for that matter, you will have to have a more powerful weapon at your disposal, be trained to use it, overcome the element of surprise they sprung on you in their attack, and be skillful enough to shoot them without danger of killing the very people you're trying to defend. There's only one place where that happens, in the movies. With a fictional character like Indiana Jones, even soldiers and policemen trained only to defend can get sucked into the undertow of misusing violence. As the recent reports about police brutality and military abuse will show, we have sacredly begun to explore the possibilities of nonviolence for resolving international disputes or national defense. As Emmanuel Charles McCarthy observes, our capacity to discover creative nonviolent responses in moments of crisis will depend on whatever we rehearse them in our everyday lives. In other words, we need to practice what we preach. What we are faced with is a long-term task of building a society founded on nonviolence. This means limiting the availability of guns, training police in nonviolent methods of control and restraint, discontinuing the sale of toy weapons, as Sweden and Colombia have done, and creating a society less tolerant of video violence and every form of domination. So where do we start? So where do we start? Before we can stop the violence, we need to come about, we need to come clean about where, where we participate in violence, willingly or unwillingly in our lives. It has to start with our children. They will not learn to be nonviolent unless we teach them. Often we romanticize childhood, speaking of the innocence of children, their purity. Children are violent by nature. The first reaction as toddlers is when they are angry is to hit bite or kick. We do not use violence as a means of discipline. They, that means no spanking, no, no smacking, and no hitting. So it's not like our children learn this from us. It is simply a, 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 nat a natural human response to hit. It is part of our lower reptilian brain that is the first line of defense. So we have to constantly say the words, we do not hit, no hitting, gentle, soft. We have to literally brainwash our children, wash the violent tendencies from their natures, clean out the striking out mechanism and replacing it with other nonviolent ways to deal with their anger. Why am I sharing this with you? Because on a day like today, we need to first address violence where it is most prevalent and most secretive in the home. Child and spousal abuse occurs in 15 to 30 percent of American homes. It can happen in any household regardless of race, culture, economic level, and religion. And so I want to say publicly in a very clear way that violence in the home is wrong. God does not condone violence and neither does the church. <clears throat> but it does happen and if you are a young person and someone in your home is hitting you or hurting you in any way including your brother or sister it's okay for you to tell someone you trust 
if you are a husband or wife and your partner is hurting you or your children and you don't know what to do about it, it is okay to tell someone you trust. And I will speak for both Pastor Jessica and myself. You can tell us, you can help, we can help you, you can trust us, we will do everything we can as pastors to stop the violence in your home. That being said, violence affects society at all levels. Our work of nonviolence must start in the home, but it cannot end there. Each of us responsible for discovering the way he or she can find and name the violence in their own spheres of influence and then resist it. And every group of committed citizens must then combine their individual power to effect the change we wish to see on a social level. As Wink says, nonviolence is a way of life, a set of behaviors, and nothing is so hard to change as habitual behavior. Nonviolence is not then the task of a season, but of a lifetime. The church, the church's own witness, should be un, un, understandable by the by the smallest child. We oppose violence in all its forms, and we do so because we reject domination. This means the child will recognize no beatings. That means women will hear no battering. That means we will gradually understand no more male supremacy of war. That means everyone will realize no more rape of the environment. The church must affirm nonviolence without reservation because nonviolence is the way God's domination free order is coming. This Sunday is one small step towards that domination free order. Are you with me on this? I want you to think of what you personally and as a family can do to stop the violence in your own corner of the world. Can you take a Sabbath from violent media? Can you devote one day that is free of violent TV shows, news programs, movies, internet sites, and video games? If you are a parent, can you make it a rule that we, that we do not play with toy guns in our home? Could you volunteer with the Domestic Abuse Project? If you are a student, can you commit yourself to not participating in bullying behavior? There are so many ways for each of us to practice creative nonviolence. And I want you to ask yourself, what can you do to further the work of Jesus and usher in God's domination free society? In fact, let's end with a prayer and ask for the inspiration of that now. So if we all pray, this is the close. Holy Spirit, Spirit of Peace, I ask that you enter the hearts and minds of each person here, every person in our congregation, and show them what you want them to do to commit themselves to peace and nonviolence. And then, Holy God, I want you to take those efforts and multiply them, expanding the ripple effect, helping the seeds of peace to take root and yield a fruit a hundredfold. Only you can do this work through us. Holy God, set us free from our addiction to violence. Show us the third way and let us for, forth in peace. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who embodied peace and nonviolence for all humanity, we, we pray. Amen. And now, with our benediction for today, Pastor Jessica. I don't know if anybody can see me. <laughs> Starting to wonder. I guess I have to stand like this. Sorry, John. <clears throat> As you can see, it's John Lennon's birthday, and I just want to say, on behalf of the Beatles friends, happy 71st birthday, John. You are deeply and truly missed. <clears throat> And as far as my benediction goes, violence never solves something or anything for that matter. We always think violence can fix our problems, but it can't. It does and it just makes it worse. It just leaves it just leaves 
too much sleep, too much violence, and it leads to more violence, and then you have an endless cycle of violence. Violence never solves anything. Break this time. Break this cycle, be it gun violence, verbal violence, physical violence. Find a way to break it. Most of all, think before you act. Like Pastor Peter said, if anyone is hurting you, you can tell us, we can help. Like I said, just find a way to break this cycle of violence. Maybe John's wish would have come true and we would have had a world with no peace and no violence. Amen.